the chapter 9 video, part 6. In this video, we're going to talk about factors that affect the E1 and E2 reactions. You'll see that several of these factors are similar to what we went over with the substitution reactions, so hopefully this will go pretty quickly. You can see that we're first going to look at the attacking species. Um, this, In this case, we'll be looking at specifically the base. We're also going to be looking at the concentration of the reaction, the leaving group, the steric hindrance of the substrate, the solvent, and then also what's a little different from the substitution reactions is the stability of the resulting alkene. So a lot of this is going to be the same, so we're going to do a couple quick a clicker questions to review. So why don't you give this one a try and see how well you can do. Hopefully you were able to get this question correct. The strongest base in this case is going to be E. Remember we're looking for a negative charge, so the negative charges on the O are all going to be stronger bases than water here. Also, oxygen is not going to be as electronegative as bromine, so all of the, uh, C, D, and E are going to be um, better bases than bromine, which is more electronegative. And finally, E is the most basic or the strongest base because it is a localized charge and is not resonance stabilized. Okay, so let's look at another clicker question and go ahead and pause the video and give this one a try just based on what you know from substitution reactions and the mechanisms so far. Okay, so hopefully you got this one right. The answer for this one is D. Notice that what we're talking about here is increasing the concentration of the attacking species. In the case of SN2, this is the nucleophile. In the case of E2, this is the base. And both of these reactions, E2 and SN2, are, are bimolecular. That's what the 2 stands for. So that means the reaction rate is going to depend both on the substrate and on the nucleophile, in the case of the SN2, or the base, in the case of the E2. SN1 and E1 are unimolecular, so will depend on the substrate only. So if we increase the concentration um, for of the of the attacking species for the E2 or SN2 reactions, it is going to increase the rate since the rate is dependent on the concentration of the base in the case of the E2 or the substrate or, or the nucleophile in the case of the SN2. Okay. So after those clicker questions, let's quickly review base strength and E2 reaction rates. So you can see in this example here, here's our base, here's our substrate. So if we were go to go through and look at how this would work in an E2 reaction, the base would come over here, pull off this hydrogen, the electrons would come down, and then the leaving group would fall off. And so what we'd end up with is we'd end up with our alkene. And you can see that the rate of this reaction is going to increase with the base strength. So if we're looking at this trend, we said that hydroxide was the strongest base of the ones that we looked at before. And you can see that it also has the uh, greatest reaction rate here. And so you can kind of see that this is um, also going to be a faster reaction rate than an amine or an O minus with a that is resonance stabilized. Okay, here's another clicker question. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can remember which is the worst leaving group. Okay, hopefully you got hydroxide. Basically, I was just asking you which was the strongest base, and we already went over that question before. So remember, your bad leaving groups are going to be strong bases. And the weaker bases they are, the better leaving groups they're going to be. So that basically is the same trend that we saw for substitution reactions. Um, so we really don't have any new ground to cover here. Just remember the same thing for leaving groups applies for elimination reactions. Okay, getting into sterics, you'll notice that the steric effect for elimination reactions is quite different um, from substitution reactions. Interestingly, tertiary substrates have an increasing rate of elimination, whereas primary substrates are going to have the lowest rate. So why is that? Let's take a look at this. So E2 reactions, unlike SN2 reactions, are going to be unaffected by steric hindrance of the substrate. 
So you'll see that the base is coming in over here. It's not attacking the carbon that the leaving group is attached to. So even if you put methyl groups here and bulk this up, it's really not going to affect how the base approaches the hydrogen. So in the SN2 reaction, your nucleophile is trying to get in here and attack this carbon directly, and there's a significant steric hindrance. But that isn't going to apply in the case of the elimination reactions. So what we, we don't have to really worry about that in terms of E2. Now, of course, with E1, you'll notice that E1 is going to be very similar to SN1. It also goes through a carbocation intermediate, so hence is going to be stabilized by a tertiary substrate. So if we're looking at um, using sterics to predict whether you have an E1 or E2 reaction, tertiary substrates can undergo both E1 and E2 reactions. Also secondary can undergo E1 and E2. Primary substrates though can do E2 eliminations only. And that's because when the leaving group falls off, you're gonna end up with a primary carbocation if you have an E1 mechanism, and that is going to be unstable. So if you have a primary substrate, E2 only. Okay, let's look at a quick clicker question to summarize. Uh, go ahead and pause the video and give this one a try and see if you can figure out which conditions are most likely to pr promote an E2 reaction. Okay, so hopefully you got this right and you selected A. E2s are gonna be very similar to SN2 reactions. We are gonna want, in the case of SN2, we wanted a strong nucleophile. In E2, we want a strong base. And both of these reactions are gonna involve a polar aprotic solvent, basically for the same reasons. So in E2 reaction, we want a polar solvent to help stabilize um, and interact with our nucleophile, but we don't want it to interact too much, right? If we were to have a, a protic solvent, then it would start to react with our base. And that's something that we don't want. Okay, have another review question. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can remember which alkene is gonna be the most stable. Okay, hopefully you got A. The key thing to remember here is that the more groups that are attached to an alkene, the more stable it's going to be. So A here would be the most stable. B with one, two, three groups attached would be the next most. And then we have D with two groups and trans would be actually uh, more stable than C, which has two groups but is not trans. So A, of course, is going to be the most stable because there are one, two, three, four groups attached to the alkene. Okay, so now we're going to get into predicting what are the alkene products. And you'll notice here that in the case of this first, this top elimination reaction, we have a nice strong base. Um, in this case, too, there's also a polar protic solvent. It's okay in this situation because even if our base were to deprotonate it, we're just going to end up with more ethoxide. So sometimes you'll see that, in fact, um, in, an, in an E2 reaction, you might use a polar protic solvent. And what you're seeing here is that we have two possibilities for our hydrogens that can be eliminated. This CH3 has a beta hydrogen. So does this CH2. So which one gets pulled off? The answer is mostly we're going to see the formation of the more stable alkene, meaning that the CH2 is more likely to be deprotonated. The CH3 is going to get deprotonated in some cases, but we're only getting 19% of that um, as a product. So the major product is going to be formation of the more stable alkene. Down here, you're gonna see the same sort of trend. We have beta hydrogens on these two CH3s. We also have beta hydrogens on the CH2. Again, the CH2 is going to be deprotonated and give you the major product, the more stable alkene, which has one, two, three methyl groups attached, as opposed to this byproduct on the right, which has one, two methyl groups, or two carbon groups attached to the alkene. So we're always looking to form the more stable alkene as the major, major product. So the reason this is, um, is because the more stable alkene is energetically favored. So if you can see in this reaction coordinate diagram, the starting materials are going to be um, the same energy here. The transition state for the formation of the more stable alkene is lower. 
and will happen faster than the less stable alkene. Also, the overall product is more stable thermodynamically. So that's why we see that happening. In an E1 reaction, you'll see the exact same thing happening. Okay, so here's the first um, kind of step here of the reaction. We have our um, substrate. Remember, the leaving group falls off, so our first step is going to be heterolysis. And you can see here the transition state of step one. We end up with the carbocation intermediate here. Here's where the reaction differs between the two possible products. So you can go the green route, which is going to give you the more stable alkene, or this um, red route here, which is going to give you the less stable alkene, which is higher in energy and also has a higher energy transition state. So remember, the first part of this is the same because it's just a leaving group falling off. But the second part is where you're going to see the difference. If we look at the transition state here, so this is what the transition state would look like for the E2. You can see that what's happening is the this is the more stable um, alkene, or the transition state that leads to the more stable alkene. And you can see that it is double bond-like. Okay, So remember, this, this single bond with a dotted line means kind of like a bond and a half. This is a little bit more double bond-like. So this is more stable than this one over here that is going to have um, a less stable um, alkene type product. I guess a bond and a half, really. So this is going to be um, the less stable transition state. So that brings us to a role called Zaitsev's role, which it basically is telling us that if you have um, two possible alkene products in an elimination reaction, you're going to get the more substituted or the more stable alkene. All right, now, of course, there are going to be exceptions to this rule. So think about this as a most of the time sort of situation. And let's look at a couple of exceptions that you might see. One of the exceptions is this conjugation situation. So if you can form a conjugated alkene, then this is going to be way more stable than a more substituted, but a not conjugated alkene. So the kind of the terms here are the formation of a conjugated diene or an isolated diene. And what we mean by conjugated is this nice pattern of double bond, single bond. So I have this on the next slide. You can see some examples of conjugated. So see double bond, single bond, double bond. This is a conjugated system, whereas a non-conjugated or isolated double bonds are going to have um, a sp3 hybridized carbon or more between them. So in this case, you only put once you start putting one sp3 hybridized carbon between these double bonds, they are no longer conjugated. So let's go back to the previous slide, and we can see here now that we have a double bond, single bond, double bond. So this is a conjugated system. Over here we have a double bond, and then we have an sp3 hybridized carbon and another double bond. So this is less stable because it has a uh, non-conjugated system. So the preference will be to form the conjugated system. And if we're looking at which hydrogen is eliminated to lead to this conjugated system, there's kind of there's a couple options here, right? So if we were to move remove this hydrogen on the CH2, that leads to the minor product. Um, or sorry, the CH right here leads to the minor product. And the CH2 over here on the left, if we take that hydrogen off and do the E2 reaction that way, that leads to your major product. Okay, so here's another example of where you're going to start to see some formation of the less substituted alkene. So this is an interesting trend. So notice that what we have is we have a sterically hindered substrate, and we also have a pretty sterically hindered base. In these cases, we start to see more of the less substituted alkene just because of steric hindrance. So typically, we're going to see more substituted, but the bulkier our base gets, the bulkier our substrate gets, the more of the less substituted we're going to see, and that's just a steric issue. So we're going to skip ahead two slides to look at this trend. So here is the effect of base bulkiness, and you can see here, this is our most substituted alkene, and as the base bulkiness increases, the amount of the substituted alkene, the most more substituted alkene we see goes down. And the amount of the less substituted alkene goes up. 
So we have a bulky substrate. And as we increase the bulkiness of the base, we start to see more of the less substituted alkene. So just keep that trend in mind and um, be able to explain why as you get a bulkier substrate and a bulkier base that you start to see the less uh, substituted alkene as a product. Okay, so let's do a quick summary of E1 and E2 reactions. Now, of course, the base um, is dependent on the E2 reaction or the E2 reaction depends on the base, right? As we increase the concentration of the base or the strength of the base, we're going to see the rate of the E2 reaction increased. E2 reactions require strong bases. E1 reactions, however, are promoted by weak bases. And I mentioned this already, but as the concentration of the base increases, then the E2 reaction will also increase. And this is also going to be for the substrate. Leaving group. Remember that we still need, just like SN1 and SN2, we need a good leaving group or a weaker resulting base. The steric hindrance of the substrate is different. Remember that primary substrates can only undergo E2, but both secondary and tertiary substrates can undergo E1 and E2. And similar to SN2 reactions, E2 reactions are most promoted by aprotic polar solvents. And like SN1, E1 reactions are promoted by polar protic solvents. And then finally, we usually see the most substituted alkene as the major product. That was Saceph's role. And then our two exceptions are going to be when we can get a conjugated species or we can get a, um, or we have a situation where we have a bulky substrate and a bulky base.